السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات وسیم حسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی آر پروسیڈنگ ٹو ورڈ لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی فائیو آف اگر برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور ان دا پریویس لیکچر اگر آئی واز ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ برانڈ ایکسٹینشنس اینڈ ان ریلیشن ٹو دیٹ وی لرن تھنگس لائک اگر واٹ آر دی اسٹریٹیجک ڈیلیبریشنس دیٹ وی ہیو ٹو انڈرٹیک ان آڈر ٹو بی ویری پرسائز اینڈ ان آڈر ٹو بی ویری accurate about the brand extensions so that we do not really wander into areas which are not really associated with uh, the territory of the main brand, meaning the patent. In addition to the deliberations, I was also talking about a few factors which have to be considered in relation to the same thing, meaning the strategic direction for uh, brand extensions. And I talked about uh, three of those, the one being um, that uh, the brand does not uh, have to have a very narrow vision. The managers as well as the brand have to be a little uh, broad-minded so that uh, the brands could be uh, stretched uh, whenever uh, the need be. I gave you an example of a brand which uh, the managers thought had become old and tired and they stopped uh, stretching uh, the brand with the result that the new entries which they went for did not really work in the marketplace. So brands could have to be broad-minded to the point, again, that uh, you do not really wander into marketing no man's land. At the same time, they, they must not be narrow-minded to the point that uh, they deny you the, the opportunities for extension. The, another um, important point that I discussed about uh, brand extensions was uh, that uh, awareness about the company and the reputation of the company and also in relation to the brand have got to be of a very high level before you start considering the brand extensions. Because you are entering a new territory, a new field altogether and it is the awareness about the company and the reputation uh, which really help in your favor in extendability. Another um, the factor that, um, that we learned was um, uh, the essence of um, the new brand has got to stay close to the main um, identity of uh, the original uh, the brand. Uh, the meaning of um, uh, the distance between the two is um, huge, uh, which cannot really be reconciled uh, by the target market. You may run into uh, the certain problems. And I gave you the example of um, the manufacturer uh, that is into the manufacturing of uh, the disposable plastic items, getting into perfumes. The customers did not look upon uh, the two uh, the markets uh, close in relationship and uh, the new field the company entered did not uh, turn out to be a friendly field. It turned out to be a hostile market. Point number four that, uh, that I did not really have time in the previous lecture to talk about is that uh, expertise and um, the ability to transfer technical know-how from one field to another is something which really matters when you start uh, considering brand extensions. Now this uh, basically means that uh, the brand uh, must be believable uh, in the new field because uh, the customers do look upon uh, your expertise and uh, your technical know-how uh, in relation to the existing brand that you already have. To give you an example, um, the Japanese the manufacturer by the name of Sony, when that got into the manufacturing of the computers and laptops in particular, the company was taken very seriously because the company had a reservoir of um, technical know-how and expertise in uh, other fields of uh, electronics. So customers looked upon uh, the expertise of the company uh, in relation to the image they had in their minds regarding the company. Uh, if that effort was um, undertaken by a company into foods or into fertilizers, for example, uh, the company may not have had the level of success with which the company I'm talking about uh, did register. So you've got to take this factor into the very serious consideration uh, to what extent the people look upon you 
uh, as competent in terms of having uh, the right technical know-how and the ability to transfer that expertise to the new field that you have opted for. Another uh, the factor that uh, you must consider before um, taking into consideration the point of uh, uh, extendability, uh, the perceived difficulty of uh, the manufacture on part of the customers. We are not to lose the basic fact that everything that we consider has got to be customer driven and customer centered because it is for the customer that we are doing everything and it is the customer who is going to provide us with uh, added sales. The perceived difficulty relates to how difficult it is to get the manufacturer with a certain product. And let us get back to the same example which I gave you just a moment ago. If um, customers perceive that uh, the technology that you have undertaken is uh, not your cup of tea, meaning they might perceive that uh, it is beyond you in terms of your uh, the technical know-how and expertise. They might not take you very seriously. So in other words, we can uh, interpret this um, factor as um, uh, the one which says, the harder it is for a manufacturer to get into a field in terms of the technical know-how, meaning the more difficult it is as perceived by the customers, the easier it is for the manufacturer to get into that new field. Because when customers start thinking that it is such a difficult technology, it is so modern that only company ABC has the technical know-how to live up to its promise and therefore this company is going to deliver. Conversely, if the level of technology is perceived by the customers as something which is commonplace, the advantage uh, which I'm talking about by getting into a field of high technology and customer perception that uh, you have uh, the compatible level of uh, technical know-how, uh, the uh, more advantageous it becomes for you to get into that field. So in other words, uh, we can uh, summarize this factor like the following, that um, the harder it is perceived by the customers to get into a particular field, the better it is for a strong brand and for a strong company to get into that field in order to get fullest benefit. And uh, the more uh, the area is considered or perceived by customers as the commonplace, the less advantage you have uh, as a strong brand to get into that area. Because so the customers start uh, thinking, well, this is something so common that uh, most of the companies do have the capability of uh, the producing uh, something which is going to satisfy all the needs. Another factor uh, which you uh, must consider uh, before um, deciding upon the extensions is the, the factor of uh, uh, what they call complementarity. Now, this complementarity can also be called fit. The meaning the fit between the two products. You have a product which exists uh, in the market and uh, you are going to come up with a new one. What remains to uh, be seen is to what extent the two products are related with each other in terms of some emotional benefits, uh, in terms of certain values. And uh, if uh, both give uh, a kind of uh, this emotional benefits to the customer, meaning the same customer or similar customers, then uh, the chances uh, of uh, your getting into that extension are uh, very favorable. Um, an example could be the, a manufacturer of uh, the fashion clothing uh, getting into perfumes. You know, similar customers or maybe the same customers uh, who are into the fashion clothing and they are the people who also love good perfumes. So uh, if you happen to be the same uh, the manufacturer uh, into two different categories, uh, the chances are into your favor because there are certain emotional associations that run across the same kind of uh, customers. So this is uh, an important uh, consideration which must not be lost sight of uh, before you start making final decisions about uh, the extensions. As a conclusion of uh, all the factors that uh, I've talked about, uh, as considerations toward uh, the extendability. I can uh, make the statement that uh, the brand extensions have got to be very logical and they've got to be very coherent. 
any incoherent and illogical extensions are going to diminish the value of the brand. And that goes without saying that uh, you get into extensions because you're adding to your brands, you're multiplying the brand family. And through that multiplication, you are bringing the more value to the company and uh, trying to achieve the growth gap by achieving your financial as well as strategic marketing goals. So much about uh, the factors that we have to consider before we get into extensions. Now, having known all those factors, let us now try to learn how do we get into the right extendability, meaning how to pick the right extension. Picking the right extension is uh, the function of a uh, very clear understanding uh, on your part of your brand and uh, your competitors' brands. Well, this again is uh, one of the fundamentals uh, which uh, have to be talked about over and over again relating any marketing concept because uh, it is about your brand and competition that the whole marketing effort is all about. So uh, a good knowledge of uh, your, your own brand and uh, brands of competition on your part is going to help you to pick uh, the right most extension. And in that uh, the connection, I would say that uh, it basically is the brand vision and uh, the brand image that you have developed or trying to develop along with uh, the brand persona and contract and everything and the brand-based customer model that uh, gives you a clear lead into the kind of extension that you should go for. Why? Because uh, it is a combination of all these factors or a function of all these factors which really defines for us the rightmost positioning on the positioning map for the product or for the brand which we are trying to extend. If we have uh, the right brand vision, could we are very clear about uh, the objectives could that uh, could we need to achieve uh, so many years could, down the line. And uh, could, that vision could gets translated, in other words, could, into all those objectives uh, that have to be uh, sought, come what may. It is um, the brand image, uh, the meaning, the associations could, which uh, could the customers have could, with our brand uh, that we know and uh, it is going to be the um, cashing in on those uh, associations uh, when it comes to the uh, question of extending that brand and therefore the, the brand persona uh, which uh, we are considering about the new entry uh, in terms of uh, the brand's identity, its uh, the personality, its uh, total uh, the set of characteristics that uh, we must consider uh, before we position the brand on the positioning map. And of course, could all these things could lay the foundation for the brand-based the customer model, uh, which is the, in a way, uh, final step toward um, uh, the positioning process. And meaning that's where the, the positioning process starts. Could you uh, end something there and pick something, another vital and very strategic uh, from there by getting into positioning. So, having known the components of uh, uh, the, the brand vision and uh, uh, the brand image and uh, the brand contract and uh, the customer model, okay, we can okay, make a few statements okay, which are very pertinent uh, in relation to okay, the brand extension. The, the first uh, statement is that brand vision helps drive your brand goals and strategic roles. All the roles which the brand is supposed to be playing to enable you to achieve all the uh, strategic goals. May those be in terms of uh, the hard numbers, the meaning financial goals, or may those be in terms of uh, the marketing objectives, like uh, the level of market share that you have to achieve and uh, the position of the brand which you would like to see um, on the on the ranking of all the brands within the category, like you might uh, uh, set this goal to yourself that uh, this brand has got to be number two uh, a year down the road, and from there on, we have to get into a direct competition or a direct fight with number one to dislodge that brand to become number one. 
so on and so forth. The image, persona, and contract help us determine the brand's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, how they do that, we have learned that by now, and uh, we are quite very knowledgeable. The customer model leads us to look into the areas of uh, needs, and uh, hence uh, provides us with a basis for uh, uh, identifying opportunities. The brand-based customer model also helps us to get into an understanding of uh, the perceptions on part of the customers uh, relating our brand as well as uh, those of competition. The brand-based customer model also helps us uh, define uh, extension boundaries. And after the customer model, let us get into the area of positioning. Positioning provides us with the overall screen uh, for uh, development of uh, the brand extension. But once we have reached there, uh, we really can pinpoint that this is uh, where we belong and this is where the extension must take place uh, with such and such name, the meaning the same name, of course, and uh, with a set of characteristics, all strategic, that uh, have to be developed in terms of uh, a strategic framework. Uh, once we have uh, all these uh, questions and all the considerations and all the cross-checks that I've been talking about for the learning process, in place, you know, we can get into the actual you know, model building. And you know, the actual model building uh, relates the uh, strategic framework that you know, we have to develop in relation to brand building. Because you know, we have reached a point you know, where you know, we are going to introduce a new brand, meaning an extended brand. The first point toward that is um, we have to explore the opportunity areas. Now, the opportunity areas is not something which is new. It took the boils down to the same things that I've talked about, meaning the clarity about the vision, the clarity about the image, the clarity about brand persona, contract, the promises, and all that. And based on the model, we have to look at those needs which are not yet met. So we are back to the unmet needs which are going now to be fulfilled with the help of the extended brand. And uh, you must take into account the possibility of uh, moving upwards when you are extending your brand uh, instead of uh, moving downwards. Uh, because moving downwards uh, does have some um, uh, negative uh, implications, which I should be talking later. But uh, the point here is that uh, whenever you are extending, you, you should extend basically uh, for the better. And you should not extend uh, for um, for something which is not as good as uh, it could be. I wouldn't say for the worse, but what I'm saying is, uh, unless you're driven into a very fierce competitive uh, battle that you really have to move downwards in order to teach a lesson to uh, your competitors, like many of the managers uh, talk about, uh, you shouldn't really go downwards. The effort has got to be toward enhancing the value of the brand and uh, not to diminish it uh, by any uh, stretch of imagination. The second step toward uh, the building that model is that you have to generate brand-based ideas so that you can carry out a very accurate analysis of the situation. You have a few opportunities and you have to go for the rightmost extension and therefore you've got to go through a process of screening uh, just to make sure that whatever you come up with uh, has to be in line with the consumer cited needs and not company generated ideas. Again, I would say that you've got to be very consumer centered or consumer centric. It is the analysis which is going to pinpoint for you that this is the accurate most opportunity which offers itself uh, for extendability and therefore it is going to be that situation which is going to enable you to be very convincing uh, with the customers that whatever you are offering does carry a point of difference and it is not the same thing which we have been selling before. So in other words you've got to define in a very convincing way the difference that the new brand, meaning the extended brand, has with the existing brand. Now, I'm talking about line extension and brand extension at the same time. 
that you've got to look into the most relevant fit in terms of the situation, whether you are getting into line extension or into brand extension. If you are get, getting into brand extension, meaning a new area altogether, then um, the question of uh, having a very uh, close fit between uh, the existing brand and uh, the new brand it may not be uh, as relevant as it sounds in relation to line extensions. But the fact remains is that you've got to uh, make it very clear the point of difference that you have come up with, whatever is the situation. This analytical process could also could addresses the, the positioning that you have envisaged uh, for the brand and also for your purchasers uh, because uh, this uh, pinpoints the exact uh, location could, on the map and could, that is a function of uh, the point of difference and uh, quality and uh, the pricing and therefore the right segment that you are trying to hit. So that is going to make very clear to you to what extent the brand has the potential to add value to the company. Now, having been done with uh, this uh, step number two of uh, building the strategic model, could we now get on to the next step, which is about developing the brand extension strategy. Uh, I would say the most important step, and uh, all that we have been doing so far uh, was meant uh, to get to this particular point which is going to talk about all the strategic moves that the company is going to make uh, toward achievement of all the goals. You come up with uh, a strategic uh, statement which is uh, just about a few sentences and uh, like any uh, statement of strategy, uh, may that be positioning or may that be uh, any other uh, area of business, this has to be uh, concise and yet at the same time be comprehensive enough to give you leads into so many different areas, meaning into the areas of associated strategies, into the areas of sub-strategies, into the areas of execution, which are going to be translations of uh, the associated strategies and sub-strategies. Uh, what do you talk about in this statement? Well, you talk about the reason for being for the brand. Why is it that you need that brand? And what is the rationale? What was the background? and what particular need the brand is going to satisfy. So naturally you talk about the, the segment and where the brand is going to operate in and uh, you talk about uh, the brand's strengths which you envisage the brand is going to deliver. For the meaning you are building into the brand certain promise which you do not really talk about uh, as part of this statement but that set of promises will flow out of this statement when you start talking about um, uh, the brand promise uh, and before that uh, the brand image. Back to the statement, you talk about uh, all the relevant factors, uh, you know, what does the product look like and uh, where the product is going to be priced. In other words, what is going to be the price quality index and in relation to that all the related strategies that you think a marketing manager or a brand manager uh, should consider and should talk about, you should put those into writing as part of your uh, strategy statement. Meaning once you have made the statement, then you start uh, getting into sub-strategies or associated strategies and uh, start uh, the pinpointing all those uh, the factors uh, which uh, are going to build up uh, those strategies and factors which are going to uh, help those strategies execute themselves. You talk about objectives, you talk about packaging, you talk about different sizes and uh, needless to say the point of difference. Uh, just to give you an example of uh, the skin um, caring uh, cream, um, competition is selling something in 40 grams and that is uh, the, the market norm. You look at the whole thing very uh, carefully and analytically and by getting into the, uh, the market research process, formal or informal, you have reached the conclusion that there is nothing stopping any player within the category to come up with something which is more than 40 grams, then that becomes a point of difference in itself. So that has its bearing uh, 
onto the packaging side and which means uh, that also is going to cause the certain changes in the production and operations and so on and so forth. But uh, you being the marketing people who are going to be responsible for uh, you know, propping the new brand up and then uh, consolidating its base, but you've got to be very clear about the formats in terms of um, the extension. Uh, whether you're going to the format that uh, only buy uh, one more size, meaning in 45 grams or maybe 50 grams, or maybe you're going to introduce uh, two or three at the same time. Uh, having a few more uh, uh, points of uh, the positioning and uh, this is how you build up uh, the uh, strategy on the basis of uh, the screening process which you carried out as a step before uh, getting down to your strategic framework. As a conclusion, we can say that uh, all the strategies and all the uh, associated uh, strategic uh, maneuvers and movements could have to stem from uh, the strategy statement about the brand that you are going to introduce. That is of utmost importance. That uh, the completes our discussion on uh, the brand extensions, the meaning line extensions and also brand extensions, the meaning getting into different uh, the areas uh, all together. And uh, with this, I would say that understanding uh, in relation to the concepts, meaning to the well differentiated concepts should be very clear. When it comes to uh, strategies and uh, the strategy statements and uh, how those are translated into um, a detailed uh, the framework, uh, they do not really worry about that because uh, the word uh, the my last lectures, uh, the I would explain to you how a strategic framework should look like. Uh, the maybe you know, we can get into developing something as uh, a hypothetical case so that uh, the you know what is going to be the fruit of the overall um, learning that uh, we are going to achieve by the end of this semester. So rest assured until that time that we shall know what all this framework looks like. Our learning about the brand extensions so far may sound like the brand extensions are the ultimate answers to creating new brands. Well, that is not the case. We've got to look into the situation very carefully before deciding whether we should go for brand extension or that we should try to create a new standalone brand. So in other words, what I'm talking about is that the brand extensions do have their limitations. Not all the needs could be satisfied by just one brand or by a handful of brands. You need to have different brands because you're dealing with different positions in different categories. So it is not that the brand extensions all the time uh, are the great recipes for creating uh, something new. It is not that. In the words of uh, a marketing expert, every time we come up with uh, a brand extension, we kill the one opportunity of uh, what could have been the creation of a new brand. He talks about the opportunity cost which we pay by not getting into a new brand which could have been a valuable brand and um, the basic objective of uh, any business is to uh, add to the value of business and uh, the more you introduce uh, the brands and the more successful they are, the more value you add. So the opportunity cost which the expert uh, talks about of course cannot be uh, quantified uh, but uh, the fact remains that um, the cost is high. Something which was not introduced could have been uh, what he calls a brand new beautiful brand. But the question is how many brands uh, the company should have or when is the time the company should go into uh, new territories with new brand names. This is a question which is uh, answered by the concept known as brand portfolio and that is what we're going to discuss. Strengths of uh, the brand extensions notwithstanding according to this marketing expert but we have to get into introduction of new brands whenever we have the right rationale uh, to go for those. And we have to look for those opportunities so that we can identify the situations rightly and start introducing new brands. 
Now, this is easier said than done. There's a cost to it. You will recall the learning in relation to brand extensions that uh, not only they offer a higher level of success, but uh, they involve costs, which are much lower, maybe in one-fifth of um, the cost of uh, development for a new brand. So the question might flash into your minds, why is it that I'm talking about the brand portfolios? Well, the reason, once again, is that not all the needs could be satisfied by just one brand. Even if you have a lot of extensions, there's a limit to the different positions that you can go for, and there's a limit to what one brand can do in one particular market, meaning in one particular category. Getting back to the point of costs, the, the marketing experts know, and by experts I mean not only the theorists, but you know, the practical managers, the people like you in the making, that uh, the development of a new brand is risky, it is costly, it is uh, the time consuming, it involves uh, the more energy, and so on and so forth. But then at the same time, it is something which offers the company a higher level of value, meaning it adds to the value. Just imagine having just one strong brand which you are working on, with of course a few extensions. And then also the think in terms of having another brand which is going to be strong or which was introduced earlier by somebody else and which is strong and you're looking after two brands. Meaning the marketing department is handling and managing a portfolio of two parent brands which are then subdivided into subspecies, so on and so forth. And then think about the power, the added power and value the company is going to uh, get to itself. Um, another uh, reason that we get into new brands and uh, like to have a portfolio of different brands because uh, different brands are in a better position to cover the market, meaning a portfolio of brands it gives us better coverage. You are covering the one market with the one brand. And within the same market, there is a very strong possibility that you have to go for another brand. Why and how? I shall get into that in a few moments. But it becomes imperative, very, very essential for the company to do that. Otherwise, you start eating to your own brand and it loses its identity and the consumer is confused. And when I say confused, it means the consumer or the customer doesn't really want to come back to your brand because he has certain complaints. So the question is, uh, if uh, a portfolio of brands is uh, that attractive and could be that uh, powerful, what should be the size of it? How many brands should we have in that portfolio? Again, before I answer that question, we have to get back into the the history of uh, the brand portfolio. Why is it that we have, uh, uh, that, that companies could have so many different brands? Well, one of the, the prime reasons that uh, the companies have more than one brand is because of the factor of growth. In order to address the growing needs, we introduce new brands. And we introduce new brands because we want to cover the market more effectively. That's what I said earlier. So in other words, when companies get into periods of growth, they like to get into new segments and they like to get into new channels of distribution. Getting into new segments and channels of distribution at times necessitates for the companies to get into new brands. There are also a few more factors which are going to make it very important for you to get into new markets and to get into those markets with new names. You will recall I gave you the example of the Toyota cars in relation to the brand value pyramid. One factor could be that the company found itself sitting at the pinnacle of the brand value pyramid beyond which it couldn't go and uh, this was an opportunity which uh, the company found to itself, meaning that by creating a new product with a new brand name uh, which could uh, attract uh, buyers from a different segment altogether and buyers of uh, those cars uh, 
who were willing to pay a much higher price. That that was uh, the level of price with which the company could not envisage uh, charging within the segment it was operating in. So this uh, was a situation in which the company uh, thought it prudent to create the new channels of distribution, meaning the company decided not to sell their new brand uh, by the name of Lexus through the same distribution network for which it had in place for Toyota cars. So in other words, what the company did was uh, it tried to uh, circumvent a conflict which could have uh, been inherent if uh, the same dealers were selling two different brands. So this is what I meant when I said companies uh, like to get into the different uh, brands or brand names when they're addressing needs of different segments and when they're dealing with different channels of distribution. The companies have got to make sure that there is no conflict of interest when it comes to fulfilling needs of customers in different segments and at the same time when it comes to dealing with uh, their uh, dealers and uh, the middlemen, you see, the, the members of the trade who uh, are instrumental in um, making those sales possible to the ultimate customer. There must be no conflict. And that can be preempted only if you get into a new brand name. The existing brand name is going to entail with so many inherent problems which are going to be contrary to the very foundations of the overall marketing concepts. So that is the one area which really necessitates or which necessitated always uh, for the companies to get into different uh, brand names and hence develop a portfolio. Another factor uh, which really has contributed to brand portfolios has been the factor of uh, the acquisitions. As and when the acquisitions took place, and uh, you will recall that acquisitions took place and they do take place with intention, on purpose, after doing a lot of homework. And uh, acquisitions take place because the intending company wants to own the brands of the target company. And once those brands are acquired, they add to the portfolio which the company already has. So that also contributes toward the growth of the portfolio. Again, making this question very pertinent as to what is the ideal and the practical size of a portfolio. Well, there is a consensus among uh, all marketing experts that uh, the portfolio should not be very large, meaning the portfolio should have a few brands, where every brand has a certain meaning and has to be supported by a certain rationale. The problem is that uh, all the brands that you may have have got to be brought into the public significance, so to say. You know, they've got to be talked about, they've got to be promoted, so that uh, they become very familiar with the uh, general public and uh, the meaning all the target segments they are really targeted at. Going for advertising campaigns or communication campaigns, so to say, for so many different brands, if you have a large portfolio, is very expensive nowadays. And uh, even the largest of the companies would like to avoid uh, giving uh, that kind of or that level of uh, compatible uh, communication exposure to all the brands uh, within their portfolio if the portfolio is large. So the need is that uh, the portfolio could be kept uh, you know, very small. However, there are you know, certain considerations. If you are an international brand, I mean an international company, and uh, you have uh, the different brands that are uh, the strong in different areas, then they may call for um, uh, different communication campaigns, and that may not uh, make the effort very expensive because uh, you're trying to uh, cover all the markets in a very effective way in terms of uh, communication. And uh, that is uh, what they call in marketing terminology, the expansive role of brands. Not the expensive, but expansive, it's with an A, uh, because you know, it deals with expansion. 
And uh, when that is the case, for example, you have very strong red brand A in country A and uh, the strong red uh, the brand B in country B. You have tried your best, but uh, the brand A does not seem to be working due to any set of reasons in country B, and therefore you have to have you know, that different brand there. This example could also be uh, applied uh, in terms of uh, the one national market, and uh, you may have you know, different brands that are having different or evoking different kinds of uh, consumer response uh, within different regions. And uh, you may decide that uh, you have to keep one brand for this region and that brand for that particular region. The point is that you've got to uh, keep your costs very manageable. And uh, that is what uh, the no managers are uh, dealing with uh, the portfolios of brands that would like to uh, escape. I mean, that is such a reality. However, if uh, the markets are common, then um, that exercise could, might amount to multiplying the expenditure could, which you are incurring could, on communications. And all managers dealing with uh, portfolios of could, the brands like to keep their uh, communication budgets could, within manageable limits. So there's a growing realization on part of uh, the managers that uh, the portfolio size has uh, got to be kept uh, small. Uh, there's no way that you can go for uh, productivity gains and cost efficiencies by keeping the portfolio large. You will recall uh, that there is uh, the dire need for uh, being very competitive in present day's world. And one of the ways that you really can cut costs is by way of uh, uh, stepping down uh, your uh, advertising campaigns or you know your communication campaigns and that is uh, one of the areas through which you can uh, go for those kind of uh, uh, productivity gains and cost efficiencies so if you have uh, a large number of brands to look after uh, there's no way that uh, you can uh, achieve all that Look at the pharmaceutical industry, the way they are regrouping their production and research facilities. Because of an awesome amount of investments that go into the pharmaceutical research, it is nowadays considered prudent and pragmatic to join hands to merge, with the net result that all those brands are being manufactured in the same factories with you know, little variations. So the question here is, there's got to be a limit to those variations so that the brands could be managed in a more practical, manageable way. Another factor that necessitates uh, the small uh, the size of portfolio is the factor of uh, the internationalization of brands. The many of the brands in the present day's global market have become international. And uh, if you have a large number of uh, the brands within a portfolio and you also want to be international or you have become international because of the efforts that you have carried out, then just look at the massive amount of investment that you have to carry out to uh, manage all the brands that you have. So this is a factor uh, which uh, makes it necessary for the managers to think that uh, the size of uh, the portfolio uh, should be small. Now, this doesn't answer the question of uh, how many brands should there be to uh, a portfolio very convincingly uh, by just talking about the, the factor of uh, the cost efficiencies or the factor of uh, the high productivity gains and uh, the factor of uh, the going international. The real answer uh, lies in um, linking every brand with its strategic role, the meaning the, the market it is going to be a uh, part of and a very clear definition of that market and a very clear definition of the segment of which the brand is going to be a part. It is through that analysis which really leads us toward deciding how many different brands we should be having. And therefore, having a different brand for a different market uh, is a study of the market segmentation. And we know that we can divide the markets by segments in terms of products, in terms of uh, customer expectations, and in terms of types of customers. Now, these are the segmentations which really define the behavior of a brand. 
and therefore out of that anticipated behavior that we have to decide uh, how many brands that we're going to have for different segments. Now this is not to say that for every different segment we get into we've got to have a different brand. No. All I'm saying is that it is the study of uh, the segments and segmentation which basically defines the role of one particular brand and on the basis of that could we decide how many brands, not really how many brands we should have to a portfolio, it is the study of that segmentation could which uh, leads us to decide could whether we should have a new brand or not. And if we have a new brand, well that is an addition to the bag. Next time when we enter this kind of an exercise all over again, we go through the same factors and we decide whether we go for a new brand for the new segment or not. I shall talk about that in the next lecture. Let me now give you a recap of uh, what I talked about in today's lecture. The discussion on extensions, the meaning line extensions and the brand extensions stands concluded. We have seen the positive sides that really drive us into going for brand extensions. And we also have seen that uh, the brand extensions, may those be line extensions or brand diversifications are not the answers to all brand introductions. They have some limitations. We discussed about those and uh, those are the limitations which take us into another area of interest and that is the portfolios of different brands. Uh, I started talking about portfolios, what portfolios are and what should be the ideal size of portfolios. Another concept that is very well known to us and that is the concept of segmentation. I will pick up uh, my discussion in the next lecture from where I'm leaving. Allah Hafiz until that time.